Welcome everyone. I'm just letting a few people get in before we start. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to CQ, a conversation with Kristen Radke and Jose Orduña. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the Black Mountain Institute operates from the city of Las Vegas and an the ancestral and unceded territory of the Southern Paiute people. Thank you to our guests and attendees for joining us tonight to celebrate the debut of CQ, a journey through American loneliness by our extraordinary art director of the Believer magazine, Kristen Radke. My name is Layla Mohammed. I'm a program coordinator at BMI. If you aren't already familiar with Black Mountain Institute, we aim to bring writers and the literary imagination into the heart of public life. We do this by way of year round events like this one through fellowships, through student enrichment opportunities and through innovative media like Believer Magazine, Witness Magazine and Black Mountain Radio. A few notes before we kick off. We want to extend a heartfelt thanks to the Writer's Block, our co-presenter for tonight's program. You can also thank them by purchasing your copies of CQ through them directly. The link is in the chat. We encourage you to engage in the conversation and add questions to the Q&A button at the, at the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screens. And if you don't already um, get our newsletter, please subscribe to learn about our upcoming season announcements. The link is in the chat. And now to introduce our guests. Our moderator for tonight is Jose Orduña. He is an essayist and educator, and he earned an MFA in nonfiction from the University of Iowa's nonfiction writing program and a BA in film video from Columbia College, Chicago. His first book, The Weight of Shadows, A Memoir of Immigration and Displacement was published by Beacon Press. Ordunia is currently an assistant professor of creative writing at UNLV. Kristen Radke is the author of the graphic nonfiction book, Imagine, On Imagine Wanting Only This and CQ, A Journey Through American Loneliness, for which she received a 2019 Whiting Creative Nonfiction Grant. She is the art director and deputy publisher of The Believer magazine. Her work has appeared in The New York Times, Harper's, Marie Claire, The Atlantic, The Guardian, Elle, Vogue, NPR, and many other places. Please help me welcome through the chat, Kristen Radke. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I wanted to start by saying thanks to um, all of my Vegas uh, co-workers and family. It is uh, amazing to work with such brilliant people and women. I want to especially thank Layla Muhammad, Vera Blossom, Lily Allen, and Sada Ortiz for making these events so amazing. It might seem like a, putting together a virtual event is not a lot of work, but it's, it's an enormous amount of work to make them run smoothly. So um, just, I really appreciate them and I hope you all do too. I also wanna say it's really fun to be here with Jose Ordunia. Jose and I have been, we went to college together, we went to grad school together and now we both work at UNLV together, which is just a, a bizarre serendipitous and very lucky um, thing to, to, you know, have a friend that you've shared so many things with so many periods of your life. He was at my 21st birthday party. So it's really fun to be chatting with him tonight. So I'm just going to start by doing a bit of a reading from the book from CQ. Um, I'm going to be reading a little bit about Vegas, a city that I really love. Um, I do want to just give a content warning that this, the book does talk, or this section does talk about gun violence and the October 1st massacre in Las Vegas. Just gonna um, minimize a couple of windows so I can see it better. Okay. A cowboy likes his horse and his whiskey, his wide brimmed hat and the picks he spins between his teeth. He likes the expanse of unclaimed dirt that settles into the crescents where his nails meet his wind chapped fingers and the ease with which he slides them into the loops along his waist. 
A cowboy's job keeps him on the trail, cooking grizzled meat over the fire as, he's, as he sips from his tin cup and gazes at the unspoiled sky that belongs to him. A cowboy's job is never done, and a cowboy's job is loneliness. He doesn't need to rely on the inconvenient confines of government or township or even civilization. His home is the broadest sweep of a sepia-tinged American West and any friendly homesteader along his path who'd love to take him in, if only he'd find the time to stay. We see ourselves as a self-reliant people who do not whine about neediness, Philip Slater wrote in The Pursuit of Loneliness, a 60s treaty against individualism. Bootstrap, bootstrap pulling, frontier conquering, make it on our own ideologies are at the foundation of what's been coined American. In America, we do things ourselves. I was raised on Westerns that idealized the handsome outsider, galloping into town and putting the bad guys in their place, snagging the affection of a dame and getting the job done right before he rides off alone. My grandpa passively explained the narratives as we watched, which I struggled to follow. It was hard for me to tell the difference between the hero and the villain because they acted much the same. They both had guns and they both seemed unburdened by their frequent use of them. They whipped out pistols from their holsters with ease in saloons and stood over the bodies of their kills with disregard. Above the couch, grandma framed a snapshot of downtown Vegas where they traveled several times a year since they were first married and where they claimed to have paid off their mortgage at the craps table. At the center of the picture was the neon cowboy bolted above Fremont Street, his cigarette flipping up and down out of the corner of his mouth with a neon flicker. There's an obvious tether beyond geography between Las Vegas and the Wild West and their illusion of lawlessness, and my grandpa responded to the call of them both, the allure of an abstract power that came with big risks and a separate set of rules than the rest of the country felt governed by. 25 years after I learned the ways of the West from my grandfather's favorite movies, I began splitting my time between New York and Las Vegas where I worked for a magazine and where I was quickly charmed by the juxtaposition of real and fantasy lives that ran parallel through the desert. What called me there was different from what my grandfather relished about the city. I never gambled and I occupied neighborhoods that could have been anywhere in the Southwest, save the stratosphere's tower and Luxor's beam that stood above the palm and olive trees in otherwise ordinary backyards. I became quickly defensive on behalf of Las Vegas, which the rest of the country wrote off so easily as unreal, or worse, a punchline. I fancied myself a bystander in a community that battled in permanence, which saw more tourists a year than there are local residents, an arid metropolis built on land unreceptive to human life. The loneliness of Vegas is visible in an obvious way, through the cliches I already knew before I ever visited. The 7 a.m. smokers at the slots, the call girls, the aging cocktail waitresses in the stuffy velvet rooms. The red dirt lit by neon seems like evidence both that the end is near and that we might just live forever. The brain's reaction to social rejection is almost identical to how it experiences physical pain. The anterior cingulate cortex works to surveil conflict. So when it senses pain, it's reacting not to the pain itself, but to, to the distress that pain causes. And since our bodies perceive social distress as dangerous, the brain reacts just as it would to a physical threat. Psychologists Roy Baumeister and Jean Twinge were the first to provide evidence that feelings of social exclusion can make people more aggressive. Participants in their studies who'd been, left to who'd been made to feel left out showed less brain activity in the areas responsible for executive control than those who were not excluded. In a companion study, those who felt isolated were more willing to inflict pain on strangers, even those they knew haven't, hadn't personally wronged them. The less one interacts with others, the more likely they are to build narratives around themselves that reinforce an impulse toward isolation. They may make concessions for the people they're close to and assume the worst about the intentions of those they're not. In her 1951 book, Hannah Arendt writes that loneliness is the common ground for terror. 
As we lose contact with one another, so too do we begin to perforate ourselves from reality. Terror can rule absolutely only over men who are isolated against each other, she writes. Isolated men are powerless by definition. Loneliness draws us to the worst possible conclusions. I feel alone becomes everyone is against me. This is hard becomes everything is terrible. I don't know that person turns into that person is a threat to me. Thinking becomes dictated by a spiraling middle of the night mind made irrational by exhaustion from which one never wakes up. Clarity never comes because we have no one to pull us from the spin. Worst, worst case scenario imaginations run wild. So when we live beneath a government that induces this and seeks to exaggerate the spaces between its people as a measure of control or rent rights, it bases itself on loneliness, on the experience of not belonging to the world at all, which is among the most radical and desperate experiences of man. If loneliness can cause us to lose sense of what is real, how do we function within a country that is constantly telling us what we trust and know cannot be trusted or known? If trust is the basis for the bonds we form, then its eradication can almost certainly ensure it's our separation. Like many American families in the 90s, mine sat down to dinner every night in front of the evening news. And throughout my childhood, it cycled through the stories of the era. A bloodied baby is carried out of a bombed building in Oklahoma. A white Bronco is slowly chased down an empty interstate. A stained blue dress is held up in a courtroom. And George H.W. Bush tells his people that an American soldier is safer at war in the Persian Gulf than he is on the streets of Los Angeles. The TV spat sensationalized stories about the country's quick decline into gangland, every intersection brimming with black and brown boys in baggy pants waiting to, in to initiate exposed children. I was too young to remember the specifics of these broadcasts or to recognize their flaws, but the old footage shows dozens of news networks fighting to keep their ratings up on a hyperbolic cocktail of racism and terror. This was as misguided as the media's characterization of many mass shooters today. After spending months reading the blogs and diaries of mass shooters, psychologist Don Dutton concluded that most shooters were fueled not by real scorn or disregard from their peers, but by a paranoia of being dismissed and rejected. Basically, he says, they got their feelings hurt easily. Coverage of the shootings, particularly if the shooter is white, quickly assigns disconnection as the cause. This explanation offers some relief. If the shooter is a loner, he is not one of us. We band together after these attacks for comfort, but perhaps also to reinforce our own belief that we can never be capable of the things the shooter has done. The collective branding of mass killers is a clumsy act of self-preservation. When shooters are connected to a community, like Stephen Paddock was before he shot hundreds of people and killed 58 below a 32nd story window in Las Vegas, Coverage responds with shock to the fact that violence doesn't always come from an outward unbelonging. He had a brother who loved him and a girlfriend, and he lived in a gated community filled with nice people. Paddock didn't write a manifesto. We were presented no interviews with neighbors explaining what a recluse he was. No one said, we always knew there was something off about him or he really lost his temper that one time. When I woke on a fall morning in 2017, clutching my phone in New York to silence its alarm, I stayed in bed into the afternoon, counting through the hours and growing body counts until I heard back from each person I cared about in Las Vegas as they awoke on West Coast time. Though I'd come to think of Vegas as a second home, it wasn't my home. And the tragedy wasn't mine, aside from the fact that it was everyone's in a country where we've made regular habits out of haggling away minutes waiting for those we love in towns we do not live in to text or call after news breaks about another shooting. The loneliness of mass tragedy is also its community, 
a sensation as we curl before a repetitive new cycle that our coming together means something. And in its aftermath, unity arises from the subjective dichotomies of right and wrong. One might say with absolute certainty, as almost everyone that I know in New York does, that the problem is the guns and the illogical laws that allow their spread. Beyond the lobbyists and the money are the collective mourners, huddled together behind their computers and phones and vigils and the more palatable cable networks, joined together by the knowledge that they are absolved, writing to their members of Congress and state representatives to say no more and enough. The others, my friends, and sometimes I will say, the guns don't kill people, people kill people, others, the arm are teachers people, those de defending their right to ammunition against an inevitable enemy, they are actually the enemy. They are the evil that has brought forth these fresh gaping swaths of loss. Sometimes, as the only person in my family who does not own a gun, I try to remind myself that these easy categories of good and evil aren't the whole truth, but mostly I ask what it means if it is. In Southern Nevada, motivational morning billboards appeared overnight across the desert like a flush of green put push through the dirt after rain. When I drove to the makeshift memorial in front of the city's famous sign a week after the shooting, I waited in a line of idling cars for my turn to walk through the maze of wilting flowers and teddy bears and letters, wiping my face as everyone there wiped their faces, the gilded windows of the Mandalay Bay just behind us, a banner covering a broken pane. Before the sign, a man in a tuxedo dipped his bride, their photographer crouching to prop the wilting flowers and teddy bears and letters from the frame. Her bouquet dangled from the hand she hung behind her. My husband bought two handguns before we met, which remain unused 10 states away in his brother's garage. That I cannot unlearn this fact brings with it occasional throbs of invisible estrangement, a fissure snaking through the domesticity we've built together. If I were to discuss it with a friend, I might say, I don't know how to love someone who once walked into a store and purchased a handgun for fun, but I do know how to love him. Perhaps what I mean is that I'm not sure how to explain the betrayal I feel that a gun 3,000 miles away has lodged itself inside my marriage, so far beyond the town I was born in, where concealed carry assumes the prideful sheen of religion, and where I was bathed and held and loved by people who have many rifles registered in their names. My husband's answers to me when I come to him every few months asking why he would buy a gun, coming to him angry because I've been running over this recollection for hours are insufficient because there is nothing he could say to make it better other than, I didn't. There are so many ways to bear arms and we do all of us all the time, whether we are the shooter or the mourner or some confused twisted thing that might still be both. To arm ourselves is the most extreme form of separation I can imagine. To move through a life without weapons is another way to remain open to the world and at its mercy. Kristen, um, it's really great to be in conversation uh, with you Thanks. today. I'm not sure if, um, sorry, I, 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 I wasn't sure if I was supposed to pause for applause, <laughs> uh, over zoom. Um, here we go in the, in the chills. Wow. Bravo. Um, yes, many applause emojis. Um, it's really great to be in conversation with you. Um, like you said, we've known each other, uh, for such a long time. Um, and just for the record, your 21st birthday party was very appropriate and sophisticated. Um, Thank you. I think we had a tower of, um, like we had like this beer tower of Corona, if I recall. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, this is such a compelling uh, and in some ways devastating book. Uh, it's also really beautiful, um, just holding it, um, experiencing the movement from one area of the page to the next, uh, feeling the particular kind of momentum and sometimes stillness that the words and images create. Um, 
And it's my impression that you didn't always work in this graphic form. Um, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but uh, I don't recall you always working in this graphic form. Can you tell us a little bit about how you started making comics, what drew you to them, and what made you kind of sort of really settle and solidify in this form? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that I was always writing and I was always drawing and I didn't totally understand that you could do them simultaneously. Like I didn't, um, I didn't have a, like, I didn't know if there was a, maybe there was a comic shop in my hometown. If there was like, I wasn't a cool enough kid to know about it. Like it took me a long time to sort of recognize comics as a form that I could work in. And the fact that comics could be not just superheroes, but also literary stories and literary storytelling and nonfiction. And so I, I started the first thing I ever, actually, we were in the same class together in grad school um, in Iowa City. I, that's the first comic I ever drew. It was I think it was called Visual Autobiography or something like that. And you made that really beautiful video. And I just I decided to try writing, a, drawing a comic. And I was like, well, that was a really amazing experience. That was so hard. And I learned so much and I'm never going to do that again. And then I, slowly in the years after graduation, I just kind of came around to the fact that that was actually the form that made the most sense to me. That's really, that's really cool. Um, I didn't know that I had been there for the <laughs> beginning. Um, and I guess a follow-up to, to that question, can you give us a sense of your process? Um, just going through the book, I became so curious about how you go about creating something like this. Do you, um, are you a writer that like does a lot of research before you approach the page? And then also, do you begin with words or images, uh, or do you kind of do this interplay uh, between both at the same time? Yes, yes to all of those things. Like I think that it's um, it depends on which part of the process I'm in, or or even like which section of the book. But I love research. I mean, I think research is the best part of making a project, other than walking away from your computer and being done with it, which is probably the best part. But, uh, but research is like, you get to, you get to be learning and you get like, everything is all possibility. And like you, you, you can read something and it just feels like it explodes an idea and you have this epiphany and that epiphany turns out to be stupid, but you have like a hundred more epiphanies. And then finally you're on the idea that you need to be the track you need to be on. And I just like to, I don't, I don't know how you feel about research, Jose, but I just love to be like interacting with other people's brains. Do yeah. you do a lot of research? Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, just going through this book and then thinking about my own process, it, it felt very much like I recognized um, something about how you use research um, and not, not just like the sort of like plug in this bit of information or something like that, but it, feel, it felt very much to me like perhaps you approach research in this way that's really generative. Um, like you yeah. go out, you go out seeking an idea, mm -hmm. um, because you've become kind of obsessed with this idea, this notion, and then you go down a rabbit hole of really compelling research and that sort of compelling journey through down this rabbit hole begins to kind of construct the piece of writing. Um, and it totally. felt very much like, like you were doing that, you know, you draw on so many different, um, incredibly interesting uh sources um and i guess I, yeah sorry guys. totally i'm just i totally agree with you yes that's exactly what i do i mean it is like to me i, th I think that's what i like about nonfiction and about essay is that you can sort of you know, I mean, as we learned in college, you know, all those workshops together, like, you know, to essays to show your mind on the page. But I, w one of the things I really like about, about graphic nonfiction is that I can actually kind of draw that process, like newspaper headlines or like the process of figuring things out. Like, I, I really like that I can move between text and image to kind of communicate that process. Because to me, generative is a great word. I've actually never thought of it like that before, but that's exactly how research feels to me. Like, it feels like I'm also writing while I'm researching but I'm figuring, like I'm, I'm researching pretty much right up until the end of a project. Like I'm, I never kind of stop that. Like, I'm never like, I know everything I need to know, you know, like I'll read something up to the end that will really change, um, really change the project. Yeah. That's so interesting. It's, it's like, 
I don't know how you feel about this, but there are some uh, works that I read where I can just sort of recognize that process. Uh, and yeah. it feels very familiar. It feels like I'm reading something that was created by like someone from my like, like ilk or something, you know? Totally. Um, yeah. it feel, it's this feeling of like recognition. Um, well, there's also like a humanity, I think, in showing it's like you're reminded that it's this is made by not just like a brain, but a, like a human person. You know, it's not just like ideas on a page. It's like you can watch kind of their like the, the flaw, you know, you can watch like the confusion that is such a huge part of writing and you can kind of see things get teased out. And I, I just I just love getting access to that. Yeah. And I guess in a way your process of doing this, of essaying in this way, is kind of an act against loneliness. You're sort of entering into communion with these other thinkers in a way that is really meaningful. You're revivifying these ideas. You're kind of drawing from them and using them to create your own trajectory. Uh, and in that way, their thinking, uh, their sort of cultural products become part of the trajectory that yours takes um and that's that such way, a it's, beautiful way to put it what's well, a beautiful process that you enacted um thanks but I love the idea that like by your like the idea that I was like seeking things out as sort of a loneliness abatement because that's exactly what I was doing but I've never really thought about it like that I mean, like, I'm curious when you're like, when you're doing research, like, are you looking for, are you looking to like prove a certain idea that you have in mind or are you just kind of letting it, like, I, I know, you know, I, I'm not talking necessarily about reporting, but like research in particular, if you're like engaging with writers or scientists or thinkers, like, do you feel like you know what you're looking for when you start? I mean, like, yes and no, vaguely. Um, but I feel like if I know too concretely and too certainly, mm -hmm. uh, it, it always creates like this kind of laden dead yeah. document. Like if I, if I go about trying to just prove something that I'm already pretty sure of, I already have the trajectory of, it just feels like the process feels dead and then it yeah. ends up being a boring piece. Yeah. Um, but when I go about it in a more open exploratory way, it always feels really exciting as I'm doing it. And then I, I think that translates into a more exciting yeah. um, work. Um, but on the topic of, of research, there's so much really compelling, uh, so many compelling ideas in this book. Um, and I have so many questions about, uh, about so many things that you explore. Um, one uh, section or, or some of the sections that I found really particularly interesting uh, was when you were exploring the work of a couple of scholars who mm -hmm. study loneliness's effects on the body. Mm -hmm. um, I found these sections really compelling and really devastating, especially because of COVID-19 and the isolation mm -hmm. that we've all endured. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this because my uh, child is two and COVID hit right when he was kind of yeah. becoming socialized to the world and having to weigh like the, the deleterious effects of loneliness and isolation versus risking contagion was like mm -hmm. so very real. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that research? Uh, I know that at one point, for example, one of the researchers likens the effects of loneliness to something as intense as like torture, agony, yeah. stress. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so so the like the world's sort of expert on loneliness, his, his name is John, uh, Dr. John Cassiopo. He died much too young a, a few years ago. And I'm, I actually, I feel like that's, I mean, it's an enormous tragedy for the world in terms of the study of loneliness, because before him, no one really took it seriously in science as a, even something to consider. 
So uh, he, he started doing these studies on, um, tissue samples, like just like a mouse swab or like a blood cells and stuff like that, that he could collect from people. And there's a survey you can fill out. It's called the UCLA loneliness, loneliness scale. It's been what's been used since the seventies by therapists and, and psychologists to determine whether or not someone is lonely. And people who scored highly on that survey were like incountably more likely to be dead by the time the study was over than those who identified as socially fulfilled. Like on average, you die about seven years sooner if you um, live alone, for example, or if you identify as lonely. And so for a long time, scientists were like, oh, of course, you know, if you don't have someone living with you and telling you like to stop eating pizza and like to stop chain smoking, like, of course, you're going to die sooner. You could like, maybe you'll fall off a chair or something like that. And no one's there to call 911 and help you. But they soon found that that disparity was much too great to account for things like accidents and things and um, environmental factors like what you ate. And the basically what's what happened when they began studying those, um, when they mapped the human genome of people who were chronically lonely, they found that you're the long, the longer you're lonely, the more difficult it is for you to fight off things like cancer, heart disease, college students who are lonely have a, they get the common colds more often. They have a harder time kicking the common cold. And that just kind of compounds as you get older. So it's, I mean, loneliness is extremely dangerous and it's something I think we often certainly before the pandemic is something we didn't talk about and consider as a health crisis, but, you know, epidemiologists are saying it's going to be a, um, an epidemic by 2030. That's so, that's so interesting. Um, yeah. And I mean, considering that those truths that you've just said, considering how real and how intense those, those effects are, um, that, that sort of leads into my next question. Um, I was really compelled also by sections where you explore the role that like emergent uh, modes of communication play mm. in creating loneliness, in, um, in attenuating loneliness even perhaps. Um, and social media is our generation's sort of paradigm shifting mode of communication. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like tech utopian promise was one of connection, yeah. right? Like that was what we were sold, connection. Um, but more and more after, you know, especially in the very recent past, uh, the really dark side of that, the dark potential has become more and more obvious. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have even, you know, Mark Zuckerberg uh, testifying yeah. before Congress uh, because tech companies have kind of created for themselves the power to physically and psychically reward practices that align with their interests and punish mm -hmm. those that don't mm -hmm. and the punishment for example on facebook uh, or twitter takes the form of loneliness and alienation absolutely um so given the intensity of those effects given that it can be deployed in this way by interests by vested interests um, I'm going to ask you a huge question and I apologize, yeah. but, um, what do you see as the trajectory of social media and loneliness in our near future, given where we already are today with that? Are we Harlow's monkeys? Are yeah. we doomed? Yes and no. I mean, okay, so I, I want to back up a little bit and say that, like, first of all, I think we don't know necessarily what the effects of social media will be because it's too young. I mean, I think we certainly know the damage it's done to, like, our, you know, our trust in science and in elections and things like that, and, like, our understanding of what is true and what is false. Like, it's done irreparable damage there. There's no denying that, that there's been, um, it's really eroded are the, the tr tr our basis and our understanding of truth, which as I just read about is the basis for the bonds we form. If we don't trust one another, we, we can't make bond, we can't form bonds and without bonds, we're all isolated forever. I mean, it's, it's a horrible cycle that we're in. But what I think is, I do think is interesting is that kind of every generation throughout, you know, modern history has assigned a new technology as the cause of all the problems. So like in one of the things I write about in the book is like when the telephone was invented, the New York Times wrote this editorial about, it was like the best line the New York Times has ever published. It was like, 
now that we have the telephone has been invented, we will become, we will soon be nothing but transparent heaps of jelly to each other, which is just like this wonderfully, uh, you know, ridiculous hyperbole. But it was this idea that like, how could we, we won't be able to communicate face to face anymore if we, if we're just these disembodied voices. And of course that didn't turn out to be true. And, and I think, you know, that there's a big difference between the telephone and, and a social network. And it is so true what you're saying about it. Like it was promised connection. I mean, it's called a network. And then the pun the punishment is that you're sort of become invisible on these feeds if you don't play by the rules. Um, so I don't know, but one of the things I am interested in is like, are our problems that are now happening on social media, you know, like selfie culture or any of these things that we criticize and like narcissism, we act like narcissism is a byproduct of social media. And I guess I'm wondering, are is social media just a platform in which we're enacting the everything we already felt and, and all of the flaws and, and dangers of being a human being. Is this now just like, have we just transferred it here? Um, I don't know. I mean, like I, you know, I mean, I dedicated this book to my dad. The title comes from uh, ham radio, which was, which he, I, I discovered as an adult that he, um, when he was a child, he had a fascination with ham radio and it was his hobby. And he would call out an amateur radio making CQ calls, which is a, kind of a calling outward to anyone and anyone can answer. And I, I, I loved that anecdote. I never, you know, when you're a kid, you don't think that your, your parents can like want anything other than just to be your, just to be your parent. You don't think about them having like hopes and desires and especially like a desire to connect with other people. And then I think about, you know, I was a kid in very early internet days when I was like in chat rooms and stuff when chat rooms were just becoming a thing. And I was, that was really the same thing as what my dad was doing. I was trying to make a connection with someone I didn't know. And so I do wonder, it, like, it, was I lonelier than my dad was when he was a kid? Or, or is it is it is a thirteen year old now with Instagram lonelier than I was with a chat room? Like, I don't know. I think those are questions we have to keep asking. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes me it makes me think about like the the difference, perhaps. I mean. In so many ways, I think it's so true that every emergent form of technology, we're like, the sky is falling. This, this is, is it. it. Yeah. This is it, you know. Um, but it seems like there there might be some fundamental difference with social yeah. media in terms of like the telephone is more or less neutral. It's like a utility that's like, it's almost like turning on a faucet. Um, and it's, it's got a certain sense of neutrality in terms of the content that's transmitted. And it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's one-on-one. -on -one, and it's also just, it's just like the, the, the conversations and the content are, remain kind of neutral and private. Now with social media, you have this, it's like the communication itself yeah. becomes part of this exchange that's on this it, it, it's this exchange that's like kind of motivated by the profit motive and also you have this like ever omniscient state surveillance apparatus thing that's also yeah. attached to it yeah um and I, it just makes me sort of wonder how or or think about how our loneliness is now being really purposefully used mm. as a form of punishment and mm. and as a form of like reward you know on social media mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know that I I'm off of all social media but I, and I guess one of the reasons that I am is because I found myself so compelled and so yeah. sort of stuck in this mode of like you know, like some of the, some of the test yeah. subjects, you know, just pushing the button, pushing the button and getting yeah. that reward. And the more, it's almost like you're entangled, the more reward you get, the more potential loneliness you feel if you yeah. don't keep doing it, if you don't keep intensifying it. Um, and that was just such an interesting and disturbing strand in, in your exploration that was just very, um, well, disturbing um, in terms of like <laughs> social media 
Harry Harlow's monkeys yeah. and thinking about like how we are like those monkeys um, yeah. right now um, and how Zuckerberg is kind of like Harlow. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's a I mean, question. should we talk about should we talk about should we talk about Harry Harlow? Yeah, I mean, that's so interesting and so So did uh, you like did, I I feel like if you like take like psych 101 or like a like an intro to psych class, you learn about Harry Harlow. Like did you know about Harry Harlow? Very you read the book? I mean, just a little yeah. bit. So Harry Harlow was there very famously, he did these, what he called surrogate mother studies. So he um, did studies on rhesus monkeys where he separated them right after they um, were born from their mothers and put them in cages with two inanimate, uh, like fake monkey mothers. And one was made of wire, one was made of cloth. And the one that was made of wire dispensed milk and the one that was cloth didn't give the monkeys anything. And he was trying to either dispel or prove the understanding at the time that babies only loved their mothers because they fed them. Like there, it was, it, they, uh, scientists didn't use, even use, usually use the word love. They used the word like proximity to describe what we now call love. And so he they quickly discovered that the monkeys wanted nothing to do with the wire mother. They, become, they, you know, they might like run over really quick to get food, but then they'd sprint back to the cloth mother. They developed these like really intense bonds with the cloth mothers. Like some of the monkeys would like stroke the edge of the cloth mother's face. And if this is a monkey that's not moving, it's just like a stuffed animal basically. Um, and so he proved this, you know, this, this really important, like life-changing um, discovery, which is that we should actually bond with our children. Before that, the understanding was kind of like, don't, you will make your kids soft if you don't coddle them. Like they shouldn't be spent, they shouldn't spend too much time with the mother. You should never put the crib like next to them, you know, the mother's bed or something like that. Like it'll make them sissies basically. And also you'll spread disease to them and they'll die. Like this was the understanding at the time. So this, that was a really important discovery. What I, what I just became really fascinated by Harlow. I read every single book I could find about him. I read everything he ever wrote that I could find because he just sort of, he made, he, he just fell into this hole and he just, for like a decade or two decades, he became more and more, he almost became like a cliched mad scientist where he was like, I'm not satisfied with this, um, with the extent of this study. So what else can I, how far else can I push this? He's like, well, I don't really know if I proved the existence of love. And, um, I don't know if att attachment is necessarily love. So he concocted things like what he called the pit of despair, which was um, he would put monkeys in, in this hole to see how long it would take for a monkey to stop trying to escape if they were given no reinforcement. And the answer is very quickly that monkey would give up and lose all sense of kind of a will to live. He would isolate monkeys sometimes for years at a time. And they would just, um, he picked, they picked up one monkey after this and that monkey fainted um, because it was so overwhelmed by being touched. Or, and a lot of them would starve themselves to death um, because they just like truly couldn't go on. And then he would for force some of these monkeys to have children and those monkeys, the, the new mothers who had, who'd never observed normal mother behaviors would, would torture and kill their babies. I mean, it's really horrific, horrible things. And he was really still never satisfied with it. And he just kept going further and further and further. And all of his colleagues were like, we should stop this. This isn't great. Um, but he just still, he wanted to keep going. Meanwhile, he's getting more and more depressed you know, his wife, his first wife leaves him, his second wife dies. And he was really kind of, he was a really horrible guy in his personal life. I mean, he was terrible to his wives. He showed no affection for his children or for, for his subjects. And I was really interested in the idea that he was trying to sort of replicate the depression and the isolation that he felt in these animals, which is not to excuse anything he did. I mean, he was a, a truly heinous person, but I'm, I was interested in sort of the project of writing about someone that, um, complicated and that vile in a lot of ways with empathy and and with love um and it was also it's it's very interesting to me how someone can contribute so much and also do so much harm in their personal lives yeah harlow those sections were really um i think particularly um disturbing and interesting especially i mean uh, not only the effects on the individual monkeys psyches, but then also like the effects on their socialization. Like when you talk yeah. about how, when those monkeys that had been isolated were then brought into a community, the community then attacked those monkeys. Attacked them. 
Yeah. yeah. They were like, this is clearly an outsider, which we see that in like the way children behave all the time. And honestly, in the way that adults behave. Yeah. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. And uh, there's so many, um, there are so many points in your book where there's this wonderful crossover um, and, and interplay between set different sections of the book that make me, that made me think about how loneliness is used, how loneliness is deployed mm -hmm. um, for particular effects, um, how loneliness is kind of um, gendered and racialized in some cases, yeah. how it's really purposely um, sort of wielded um, in mm -hmm. order to more easily control people, um, enact, um, reactionary politics, yeah. um, really, really, uh, incredible, um, exploration. I, I want to leave plenty of time for the Q and a, uh, but I do have just one last question. Um, and it's, uh, again, about, um, this year that we've all had, I mean, this year has been in many ways, like, and among many other things, a year of loneliness, of really intense isolation. Um, given all of your research, all of the thinking that you've done about loneliness, um, what do you see as, like, uh, do you think we have been, uh, as a society of individuals, do you think we've been changed uh, is the change temporary? Is it uh, going to take root? How will we emerge from this year of intense isolation? I mean, that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I think that um, the loneliness of the pandemic is very different from the, from chronic loneliness or from someone who's maybe feeling isolated. I mean, the other thing that we haven't really talked about in this conversation is that loneliness is sort of baked into the DNA of America. Like America is so much about individualism and like bootstrap pulling. And I mean, I talked about the cowboys, like cowboys are a complete myth. It's like an absolutely absurd concoction. Cowboys not like that never existed, but they're the basis for like all of our storytelling about like strong outsider men, like Don Draper and all these people. Um, and that's really harmful. I mean, like the part of the American dream includes a literal fence, a white picket fence. I mean, it's like the measure of success is your ability to put space around yourself and other people, which is absolutely completely backwards. It's not how humans should live at all. So I think that when we're, that's one of the reasons we're in the problem that we're in. It's not to say that America is the only lonely country in the world or even the loneliest country in the world, but it is sort of baked into who we are. And I think we do have to really reevaluate that. But the pandemic, I think, brought forth the, I think one of the silver linings of this horrific year and a half has been that we talk about loneliness more openly than we did before. Like loneliness has often been a shameful thing that we don't want to admit because it feels like a personal failing when it's not. I mean, loneliness is an extraordinarily universal feeling. It has nothing to do with your network or your community of friends and family. You can feel really lonely in a house full of people as, as most of us have experienced ourselves. So my hope, I guess, is that I think in the pandemic, we were also reminded how much we need one another to survive. When I, we saw things like mutual aid groups form, and I know my neighbors much better now than I did before the pandemic. Like we really relied on each other. And I hope that we can, I think the question is really, can we hold on to some of that when the emergency has passed? And I think that remains to be seen. And knowing our track record, I think probably we'll fail, we'll fail at that. But I, but I hope that we won't. I mean, I think that my book is a, is a hopeful book. I hope people read it as a hopeful book because I do think we, we can, if we listen to our loneliness, we can sort of use it to guide, guide our way. It feels like the best kind of hopeful, which is to say extremely complicated uh, <laughs> and not at all saccharine or straightforward. Um, it's precarious hope, um, that kind of, lays it at our feet, um, so to speak. Um, well, thank you so much, Kristen. It's been really, Thanks really a pleasure to be in this conversation with you. I'm going to now uh, open my Q&A tab and I'll be reading, uh, I guess, some of these questions. Uh, I was told to just read from the top, so that's what I'll do. Um, and then please feel free to um, answer um, as you wish. Okay. 
let's see. Uh, so, oh, oh, before you start, I also did a really bad thing and I forgot to thank Writer's Block, the most amazing, like probably the most amazing bookstore in the world. So I just want to say a huge, huge thanks to Writer's Block. And I hope that we will all be gathering there in person soon. And thank you to Scott and Drew and Haley and Nick and everyone who works there. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you to the Writer's Block. <laughs> it's a very not lonely place. Um, it's, that's very true. Okay, let's see. The questions are shifting order, but I'm going to try to read one before it shifts. Uh, Kristen, your care toward human subjects reminds me of Adrian Murray Brown's work on restorative transformative justice, especially in We Will Not Cancel Us. What's the biggest challenge when trying to represent a heinous person or someone who you may be easily tempted to reduce to a one-dimensional villain? Sin, that's such a good question. I think I don't necessarily want to write about someone if they are one dimensional. Like, I guess I feel like I haven't done my job or I haven't read enough or thought enough if they remain sort of one dimensional. I think like someone like Stephen Paddock is different. And I maybe mentioned him in passing. I didn't want to render a person like that. I think we spent far too much time rendering uh, and, and asking questions about mass shooters and, and not enough time talking about the people that were um, lost because of them. Like, I think if we list, you know, if we list the, many of us can list the name of a dozen mass shooters and probably fewer of us can name the names of a dozen people that were killed by those mass shooters. So I I very intentionally didn't want to write much about him. But I think with someone like Harry Harlow, I, I want to understand how a brain works and how one is led down a certain path and how one does do heinous and unspeakable things because every single person alive does heinous and unspeakable things on tiny scales every day. And so I think I try to approach writing with empathy. And I think empathy is also the only way to write anything. Um, or at least to me, it's the most important quality. It's the most important quality. Like the most, the biggest compliment anyone could ever pay to me is saying that was a very empathetic work. Like to me, that's the biggest success that I could ever have. Okay, I will read this next question. Um, what would you say is the main difference in mindset between someone who's lonely and someone who's not? Uh, this questioner is particularly interested in how this applies to older people. So loneliness, I, I like to think of loneliness, the way I describe it in the book and the way that it's described by some scientists is basically that loneliness is the distinct is the is the sort of gap between the relationships you have and the relationships you want. Like loneliness li lives in that middle space, and I think that's a really simple, clear way to to think about it. I also think that Maggie Nelson had a great description of loneliness when she said that loneliness is solitude with a problem, which is a really simple, beautiful way to explain what loneliness is. We often conflate solitude and loneliness; and they're two totally different things. Some people can be really satisfied with loneliness or with with solitude, and others find solitude very lonely. But the other thing that's really important to know is that we all have, everyone has a different biological threshold to loneliness that's literally programmed into our DNA. And it's not a thing that's possible for us to change, which is why it's part of that is like introversion, extroversion. It's similar to that. But, you know, I have a friend who says she's, she can't, can't remember a single time in her life she's ever been lonely. Um, she's just not, she's literally not wired that way. So I think, um, it's not necessarily a mindset as much as it is a set of circumstance. I think that the most important thing when one is feeling lonely is to understand that the thoughts and feelings you have when you're lonely aren't necessarily rational or rooted in reality because loneliness in our isolation, we're usually our worst selves. Like we, we, um, we can be reactionary. We can be aggressive. Like I was reading about earlier. And so I think it's really important when we're feeling that way to try to override some of those thoughts and to uh, kind of approach the world with empathy, to reach out, um, and to try to push past some of those feelings. Like scientists have discovered that, um, loneliness is actually contagious and that when your one is feeling lonely, they can actually transmit loneliness up to like three degrees removed from them. And that's because when you're lonely, you um cut other people off it's just like a natural reaction so i think fighting that impulse is probably the most important thing when you're feeling lonely i hope that helps i mean i don't i i didn't solve loneliness by this book i i wish that i could have but we have a lot left to learn okay let's see 
this next question. Um, what do you think of the idea that social media enlarges our concept of the world and sometimes amplifies distance and that vastness fuels loneliness? Whereas old technologies like letter writing and phone calls inspired intimacy. Yes, I think I would agree with that. Um, but I think also enlarging our concept of the world is a very beautiful thing. Like that, that, and I think that we can hold both of those things like yes and with social media. I think enlarging our concept of the world and getting access to a world one by maybe you don't have someone to write a letter to or call who has that frame of reference and that understanding. I mean, it's like, well, that's why we read books. That's why we watch television. That's why we watch movies. It's to, it's to gain access to perspective and people who aren't our, in our immediate lives. And so I think that actually is a really beautiful thing about social media and a benefit. I mean, we watch things like, you know, like the Arab Spring happen on Twitter. Like there are very valuable um, social movements that have fueled, me too, fe happened on Twitter. You know, there are things that have been very important that have happened on, with this tool. The problem is that it can be misused very easily and to disastrous consequences. So it definitely amplifies our distances. I think we're often our worst selves online. We act in a way we would never act in real life. We've seen that over and over and over again. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's both things, but I also think that, you know, for some people, I have a, a friend, um, who's a care who's a full-time caretaker for his mother who has Parkinson's disease. And he said, you know, the pandemic for us, we were, we've been on lockdown for many years because she can't, she has no mobility. And so actually things like online communities have literally been a lifesaver for her because she's able to connect in a way she can't in person. So there are, I mean, there are benefits to every tool we have, just like there are catastrophes. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, it, it makes me think about just during the pandemic, uh, my child, for example, wasn't able to see his grandparents at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it weren't for FaceTime, he wouldn't know them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. Next question. Well, a question just disappeared on me, um, but I will ask the following question Hi, Kristen. Thank you for this amazing discussion. I'm curious if you read poetry. Some of your lines seemed, oh, oh, I just shifted. Some of your lines seemed tuned into poetic lines and rhythms. If so, who are your favorites? Thanks. Um, yeah, I love poetry. I, um, I don't read it as much as I would like to. I, um, I, you know, I mean, I love Natalie Diaz, Jerrica Brown. Um, uh, Blue Hour is probably my favorite book of poetry by Carolyn Forche. Um, I, I learn a lot from poetry and I come back to certain lines a lot, but um, it's very nice of you to think that I sound like a poet sometimes. That's a great compliment. <laughs> okay, and I have one uh, final question in the queue here. Um, Kristen, what have you read in your studies about how loneliness conflates across racial lines and the ways in which white supremacy impacts non-white people groups in a deeply racialized society? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll say that actually there's been almost no research done on this and it's something we really need to invest money in. Um, the, the places that we've, we've really seen these studies happen is about interracial adoptees who are statistically some of the loneliest people in America because they are parts of the communities in which they don't, they have, you know, your most intimate person, your parent, can't um, understand your, your sort of the way you interact with the world and the way the world interacts with you. It's, it's, it's extraordinary isolating. So um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen a little bit of research about how um, different communities like in, in particular cities um, interact with loneliness and experience loneliness, but it's wildly understudied and something we um, need to invest a, a lot more in. Um, and I'm not sure if our time is limited to the hour, um, if any of the wonderful Black Mountain Institute people would like to just chime in, um, we can wrap up. Okay, wonderful. Uh, it's, it's been really a really compelling, interesting conversation. Thank you for writing this book, especially now. Thanks for saying that. Um, like I said, I think that the book itself enacts a really furious blow against loneliness. Um, 
and we really needed that right now. Um, so Thanks. thank you. It was a pleasure to read it, and it was a pleasure to speak with you today. Thanks. It was really special um, getting to chat with you tonight. So thanks for making the time. Thank you so much to our guests, um, Kristen and Jose. That was an amazing conversation. Thank you to the teams at Black Mountain Institute and our co-hosts at the Writer's Block. And thank you for all of our attendees tonight for joining us. Please support our indie bookstore and Kristen by, support, by purchasing CQ, A Journey Through American Loneliness from the Writer's Block. The link is in the chat. Thank you and good night.